Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, How to Make Your Grow Room HVAC Work for You. My name is Eric Sandy, and I'm the digital editor of Cannabis Business Times. We are very pleased today to welcome Josh Spaulding from Quest and Aaron Hook from Hawthorne Gardening Company for today's event, where you're going to learn how to make your HVAC work for you with the end goal to maximize your ROI and your yield. Today, we'll be focusing on dehumidification and how to properly size, specify, and install your solution, as well as new tools and resources available to growers. Uh, before we begin with the presentation, just a few quick notes. You're going to see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. If you click that, you'll open the Q&A box. Feel free to type your questions in throughout the presentation. And at the end of today's event, we're going to try to get to as many questions as possible. Also, just know that we are recording today's event, and we will be distributing that recording to all registrants via email. So you will have all the slides and the whole presentation delivered to your email very soon. Uh, with all that being said, now I'm very pleased to welcome Aaron Hook. All right, thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. Uh, you know, I think the the big thing here is you know what Josh and I are excited to talk about today is you know really the you know the Quest product, but also a lot of the you know the you know the way that we go about we size product and we make sure that you know it's it's purpose built um, it's not a one size fits all application so um, you know I've been in the industry for a long time now 17 years uh, and I've worked with Quest I think with the relationship started in 2012 2013 with Sunlight Supply and then with the acquisition you know followed into now this uh, great relationship where we get to work alongside the, the Quest engineers and really provide excellent solutions to each one of the growers. So uh, with that, you know, I'll allow uh, Josh Balding, the, the true technical expert here to uh, run through uh, quite a bit of inf information. Hey guys, yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us today. Um, as Aaron alluded to, there's, you know, there's a lot of, lot of ways you can do stuff, um, a lot of right ways, a lot of wrong ways. So we kind of just want to take today to sort of provide some general guidelines, um, talk about the Quest product uh, specifically, but there's also going to be a lot of uh, other things, like as you can imagine, your, your airflow, your HVAC, all that, your cooling system, all that uh, works together to, to help you, you know, kind of optimize your climate. So I'm going to be going to be talking about all that. Um, been with Quest for a little over three years. Um, started working uh, with with Aaron almost immediately when I started with Quest. So we've got a long, uh, long working relationship, worked on a lot of projects together. And so this is exciting. Um, I put my contact there below. It'll also be at the end. So uh, feel free to, to reach out. Um, if you don't get your question answered in Q&A or you have something come up later, feel free to reach out. Always happy to, uh, to answer those questions. Um, and without further ado, we'll, we'll jump right in. I don't know if you want to take it back over and talk about yeah, the partnership sure. here. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so thanks, Josh. I, I think the, the one key call out here is as we're looking at, you know, the, the, the full, you know, full solution um, into the industry, uh, Hawthorne's really, you know, chosen great partners and also, you know, developed internal brands that, you know, we continue to be that one-stop shop for growers. Um, you know, I think that, you know, as the industry has evolved, we've matured, uh, we're looking at, you know, truly providing the best solutions that aren't just a, again, one size fits all. It's a technical solution. And we're really customizing this and get, making sure that everyone's individual application, uh, their, their rooms, the, you know, if they're going single, multi-tier, whatever it is that, you know, we're, uh, we're really focused on that and providing the best products and support possible. Um, and Quest really fills that, you know, uh, for us on the HVAC dehumidification side. Um, you know, their, their product is truly amazing. Um, I, I would never uh, ever jeopardize my grow um, with any other type of product, any other type of dehumidifier, just because, um, you know, it really is, it's built to last, built really tough. Um, and especially with the harsh environments that are created within, you know, these, these certain spaces, you know, the, the Quest units always stand up to it. So, um, you know, I, and I also uh, personally uh, love working with the team over there too. Um, it's just great to work with good people and uh, that truly, you know, want to do the best they can with their products out there. Awesome. So yeah, I guess we'll take kind of a quick step back. I assume most people have heard of Quest. Um, if you haven't, uh, we're, we've been making dehumidification equipment for a little over 40 years um, and in a wide range of applications, anything from homes to industrial application, restoration. Um, but uh, Quest specifically focuses on gardening um, and a couple other smaller uh, industrial applications as well. But primarily, we, we do focus on indoor agriculture. Um, and so 
to date, we've got about 165,000 installs across the world. Um, we, we are uh, bigger than just North America. Um, so, you know, we've seen a lot, of, a lot of ways to do stuff, help a lot of growers across the, across the country and world dial in their humidity and their grow rooms. Um, really the three things we kind of uh, highlight about our product is the efficiency um, and really the quality and the service that comes with it, not only on the front end of working with you guys to figure out your specific case and what you need and what the best configuration is for your grow, but also on the back end in, you know, things, things happen from time to time, um, whether, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe equipment issues, maybe, uh, maybe end up putting more plants in the room than you thought things, things change. Right. And so on that back end, we're there as well to help support and make sure you we're there to help you guys dial in, dial in your, uh, your, your environmental control. Um, so that being said, um, kind of as a nice segue um, into efficiency and really why it matters so much. So uh, the, the easiest uh, thing to recognize with efficiency is, is you, you use less power. Um, and, and the more efficient equipment in there, right, the less kilowatt hours using, the less amp draw. So, you know, that has a lot of implications beyond just your power bill. Um, it might mean having to put in uh, you you get farther with the amps available. Uh, one of the common things we hear is, you know, I don't have enough power. And, you know, the municipality might not be willing to give a power upgrade for a year. And so, you know, using more efficient dehumidification equipment really allows you to go further on the amps that you do have. Um, because it uses less power to dehumidify, it also produces less heat. Um, and so uh, is as you might imagine, less efficient equipment produces more heat. Um, and so that can have a lot of implications as well, which we'll talk about as far as, you know, do you have to put in a bigger cooling system or do you expect your AC to run more, which also uses more amps. Um, and so, you know, let, less heat's a big one as well. And then finally, there's a lot of rebates available. Um, and so we'll kind of touch on each of these, but uh, rebates are pretty huge. Um, depending on where you're at, um, every, every county is a little bit different. Um, there can be, uh, uh, you can get money back for putting in uh, efficient equipment. Um, and so again, we'll talk about kind of how that works in a couple of slides here. Um, but just to quickly touch on an ROI, um, a return on investment. So if we look at a typical, say, 1,000 square foot room that uses about 1,500 or, or where you're removing about 1,500 pints per day um, and, and look at, uh, look at, you know, what a traditional electric cost uh, on average about 12 cents across the country. If we look at, you know, what it looks like to remove 1,500 pints a day for 365 days a year um, between uh, like our Quest 506, for example, and a, a less a less efficient option out there, a 700 pint unit that's a little bit less efficient. Um, while it may not seem much at face value, just, you know, a, a pint or two per kilowatt hour difference, it really does add up over time. You know, you're looking at um, an annual electricity cost of a difference of about $2,000. Um, so, you know, you multiply that out over one, two, three, four, five years, and you're, you're looking at for one room, just the difference, uh, an electrical difference of about $11,000. So, you know, you can imagine as you start to look at this across multiple rooms, depending on how big your facility gets, you know, that there can be some serious cost implications and some serious savings by moving to more efficient equipment. Um, and like we talked about earlier, less efficient equipment also produces more heat. So what this doesn't account for is, you know, how much extra are your air conditioners running um, because there's a higher heat load in that space. And so um, if we look at kind of the net heat gain on the space um, for this for this example case of, a, you know, 1500 pints in a thousand square foot room. You can see that the, the, the less efficient unit's going to add about 7,200 BTUs more. Um, that's about 28% more heat. And so you can imagine your air conditioner is going to be running 28% 28, 28 more of the time. And there's some cases um, I've even seen where using less, uh, less efficient equipment, you have to oversize your AC as well. So, you know, there's some big cost implications there. Capital equipment costs of putting in a bigger air conditioner more runtime, you know, all these things add up. So, you know, eleven thousand dollars on a on a thousand square foot room is 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 fairly conservative, and and you I've seen that cost get higher depending on on the case we're looking at. So, 
we're always happy to help you run these calculations if you're comparing multiple uh, multiple solutions. Um, anyone on the Quest team uh, uh, would be more than happy to run through the calculation with you. I'd, I'd be more than happy to as well. So if you're looking at a couple different uh, different options and you want to see how that impacts your specific grow, we're more than more than willing to do that. And then finally, um, talking about rebates. So Hawthorne has an exclusive offering with Synergy. So um, rebates can be a tricky thing. Um, like I said earlier, everywhere is a little bit different. So um, depending on where you're at in the country, it might be different. Uh, it might be a different path to get that rebate. And really there's two kind of broad categories for how to do it. Uh, one of them is prescriptive, meaning that uh, somebody kind of did the work up front and you know, you know there might be a set dollar amount you get per, uh, uh, per unit you put in. Um, real easy, unfortunately, it's a bit rare. Most of the time, uh, the way you're gonna get your rebate is a, uh, is a custom path where you work with the, re the, the utility company and you say, hey, I'm putting in um, this equipment, which is a little bit more efficient than the baseline. Um, and then they, they calculate your rebate based on that. Um, custom paths usually take a little bit more time. So I always recommend start early. You know, you, you can look up to, you can be up to, you know, might take two to three months to go through that process. So um, always recommend starting your rebate, uh, the whole, the, you know, your path to rebate sooner. Um, Synergy, uh, Bob Gunn with Synergy uh, has, you know, there's a, a partnership with Hawthorne there where, where he's, you know, he's a pro at this. So, you know, it might sound a little bit complicated and, and it is, but he's a pro. He knows a ton of people across the industry um, and he can essentially help handhold through that entire process and make sure that you're getting the most the most bang for uh, buck as far as when you're putting in your efficient units. So to give an idea of uh, uh, what kind of rebates are available, uh, we use the Quest 506 in the previous example. You, the MSRP on that um, is a little over 7,000, um, but you can get rebates as high as $3,300, um, uh, anywhere from 40 to 300. Uh, 3,300 or so. Um, the 225, which is another real popular unit you see everywhere, you know, you can get up to $1,700 for putting that unit in. And you might've noticed the quest question mark there. Um, we're gonna be releasing a new unit here, uh, announcing it MJ Biz. Um, so a little bit of a teaser there for you. You might see as high a rebate uh, as is about $2,200, $2,300 for that one. So um, we're going to have a little bit more on that at the end if you're curious, um, but definitely stop by, stop by our booth at MJ Biz and uh, to, to see the new unit. Um, to give some examples of, uh, of what kind of rebates are out there, um, was talking with Bob a little earlier this week and was able to, to, to he was able to share a couple examples. Um, out in Oklahoma, a 30,000 square foot facility out there put in 126 506s and able to get about $89,000 back. Um, a, a, a bunch of growers out in Detroit were able to get about $480 each for every 506 they installed in their facility. Um, another Michigan cultivator um, in a different municipality was able to get a, you know 70,000 for for the 42 units he put in. Um, and then out in Oregon, a, a hemp cultivator uh, was able to get uh, about you know $56,000 back in his 11,000 square foot facility for putting in uh, more efficient dehumidification. So the dollars are there; they really do add up. Um, you know, beyond just the, the ROI on, on the electrical savings uh, between your DHUs and your AC, um, there's huge rebate potential. So definitely rec recommend hitting up Bob Gun. Make sure to do it, you know, a couple months before you're going to install DHUs. So there's plenty of time depending on, you know, what path you have to go to, to secure that rebate. But there's definitely some big dollars available. And I'd recommend everybody, um, you know, see what's available, available for your cultivation. Hey, Josh, real quick, too. I, I think yes, that, just a reminder uh, to the group is, I mean, this is free money. I mean, this is, you know, out there today, the utilities offer it. And so, um, you know, taking advantage of this and, you know, whatever, you know, wherever you're at within your facility, if you're looking to upgrade or you're building out a new one, um, this really does help, uh, you know, especially with all the, the different uh, retrofit costs. So, uh, you know, free money, it, it, it's definitely worth it. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, jumping into really the, the, the meat of this, this webinar is how do, how do you get the most out of your HVAC? 
Um, and, and what I'll say right off the bat is, you know, I visit a lot of cultivations. Um, I've helped, you know, helped a lot of people fix, fix problems. And, and most of the problems I see are, are really kind of can be boiled down to either improper spec, meaning, you know, there's not enough of one thing, whether it's dehumidification, whether it's cooling, whether it's airflow, or maybe a mix of those things, um, or, or it's maybe there's the right amount of capacity, but it's not installed correctly that might be you know installed in a subpar way which is causing there to be a you know the system not to behave as it should so we're going to kind of go over each of those um, and kind of you know things to watch out for general best practices um, and 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 kind of address them all so um, in starting with uh, proper spec proper sizing um, at quest we say you know water in equals water out so essentially however much water your uh, those plants are drinking which is you know your irrigation minus minus runoff um, that's what we need to be sized for to remove um, and so to give a quick example um, that's, that's easy math if you've got a thousand pints going in your room at about 20 percent runoff you know you got about an 800 pint load um, and so you know what what do you what do you need there well you know uh, if you've got 120 volt power, you know, four 205s might be a great, a great option. Now, there is something to be aware of is if you are, if you are aiming for cold, dry conditions, you know, if you're trying to hit maybe 40 to 45%, um, or if you want to run your grow rooms a little bit colder, you know, below 70 degrees, you might consider adding an extra unit or two. Um, and the reason for that is, is at colder and drier temperatures, you typically see a little bit of a capacity loss in all refrigeration equipment, including your ACs, including DHUs made by other manufacturers. And so sometimes you have to oversize a little bit to account for that capacity loss when you do go, uh, when you do drop your room temps or, or try and dry out the room. So if you ever have any questions, again, please, please reach out. We're always welcome to uh, we, we welcome the, the opportunity to take a look at your room, look at your loads and 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 help guide you to the best recommendation um, to, you know, and so once 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 you know your load, um, really, the next step is is proper spec. So in this case, you know, we have an 800 pint load, we know we need 800 pints of dehumidification, but what's the best way to get there. So I always say at least two units per room, um, but if you do have the space, four to you know four to six is is really ideal. Um, and the reason for that is, is, is there's a couple. Uh, one is redundancy. Um, you know, having having more units means that in the event something happens um, to you know your unit or or maybe something happens to your your, your breaker goes or something or your power surges you know any any number of things can happen um you know having more units uh limits your liability there if something does go wrong um it also gives you stages of control so it gives you it's kind of like thinking uh if you think like more speeds um for your room so very you know these rooms are incredibly dynamic the loads are constantly shifting so being able to to you know have 800 pints uh, to use the previous example, or maybe roll back, you know, to, to 600 or 500 or 400, the more units we have in that space, the more we can dial into exactly what the room needs, uh, which will really allow us to maintain tighter control. And then the, the third reason is, you know, if we have four units, we can really spread out that dry air, we, we minimize the risk of, of having warm pockets of air or, or dry dry pockets. If you have one or two units in a room, it may be a little harder to, to get that, that, that dry air spread out. Um, and a question I often get is, should I use desiccants? So uh, if, if you didn't know, Quest does have a whole line of desiccants. Um, desiccants use a slightly different technology for, uh, or rather a very different technology for removing water. Um, it's a little bit less temperature dependent. Um, the downside is, is that it's incredibly uh, uh, inefficient when compared to refrigerant dehues. So uh, more often than not, for most cultivations, it doesn't make sense to use a desiccant because it's, it's just not as efficient. Most grow rooms are kept in the temperature ranges that you can still use refrigeration dehumidification, and it'll be four to 10 times more efficient than a desiccant. So most of the time, the answer is no. There, like I said, there are a couple niche circumstances where it might make sense to, to use a desiccant. Um, and again, if you have a question, if, if you're that niche case, feel free to reach out and I can, you know, we can talk through it and I can let you know. But most of the time, it's it's usually, usually refrigerant dehumidification is, is your best bet. 
Um, so the next question I get after we, we you know, we go through the, the, the capacity, the sizing, and then the specification is, where do I put the DU? So, um, you know, the, what I generally recommend is spread them out evenly in the room. We want that, that warm, dry air spread out evenly. Um, you know, and that's if you can. If I've had a lot of cultivators where, you know, depending on how their room layouts, maybe it's ceiling high, maybe there's other equipment in the room, and they, they're forced to put all the units on one side. Um, you know, if you have to do that, if you, as long as you make sure you have good airflow, um, you should be able to make that work. We're talking, you know, what's the most ideal thing you can do. And, and if you can, it's, it's spreading out those units uh, kind of like, so if you had four units, if you think, you know, divide your room into a, uh, four grids and kind of place them in the middle of those zones. Um, always recommend to hang them above the lights if you can, just so they're not casting shade. Um, you know, if you could technically put them, uh, put them underneath the benches if you had the space, but most of the time, the, the, the place where you have most space is just, just hang them above the lights. Um, they're out of the way. You don't have people bumping into them. Um, you know, floors generally, you know, you can't put them on the floor as well, but again, they might be in the way of people walking around and stuff. Um, the other thing I recommend is, is to hang the unit so that the filter side and the exhaust side are at least four feet away from the wall. Um, you know, we want to be cognizant that we're not somehow impacting the unit's ability to draw in air. So if, um, if, if I've seen sometimes where units are mounted right up against the wall, when this happens, sometimes that limits the, the unit's ability to, to, to pull air through the unit. And you can sometimes see um, the, uh, sometimes see, the, you know, a capacity loss from that. Um, so, you know, if, if we recommend about four feet, I say, hey, at least get that unit a couple feet off the wall for best performance. Um, as far as general layout, um, I always recommend to, to hang them in such a way that you don't have your AC blowing into the DHU and, and vice versa. So um, we want to make sure that we're not blowing cold air into the DHU because that'll limit its capacity because that's cold, dry air. So you can only, you know, if you are at the units, getting dry air, it can only dry it out so much more. So you can come, if, if you're short changing air like that, sometimes you can see a capacity loss in your equipment. So the photo on the right is from a, a cultivation I work real close with. Um, you can see that, that that AC vent is really, uh, really close to that intake. So what was happening is they really weren't getting the full capacity of that 225 that they could have been. And so, you know, the, the really the best thing to do if, if you've got a setup like this is you can either add a little bit more ducting to get that air further away from the DHU, or you could potentially maybe flip the DHU 90 degrees or, or 180 degrees. Essentially, we just don't want our AC blowing air into the DHU. And then uh, likewise as well. You don't want the DHU feeding warm air into the AC because you'll limit the AC's dehumidification capacity as well. And then finally, you want to make sure the DHUs aren't, aren't, you know, feeding air into each other. Um, you know, all this kind of, it, it, it really impacts the overall dehumidification the units do and, and might, might be shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit. Um, and then uh, one, one final thing is, you know, make sure uh, when choosing the room height, um, to factor in that you got to hang ducting up there, you got to you, know, you got to fit your ducting for your AC potential your AC units. Um, you might have UV filtration. Uh, you might have CO2 stuff. Um, you, know, you got a lot of equipment to fit, and so giving yourself enough space so that you don't end up with all the equipment kind of on top of each other and short changing air is real important. Um, generally, as a rule of thumb, I think, you know, about 12 to 14 feet for single tier um, it is a good range to be. Um, for two tier, I, I like to be have at least 16 feet, but if you can get up to 18, really gives yourself uh, a lot of space. Again, you can always do it with less, um, but you have to take maybe some extra, extra precautions and, and there's some other things you have to worry about when you do that. Um, Moving on to, to something else, one of the things I see uh, folks forget a lot is, is tea traps. So if you've ever had water leaking from the corner of a unit, uh, a quest unit, 99% of the time, uh, it's because there's not a P-trap. So the reason this happens is the unit uh, is in negative pressure, meaning it, it wants to kind of suck the water back in. So if you, as long as you have a P-trap of water in it, it prevents the unit from drawing back in water. So I put the kind of the general guideline here, um, you know, if you can do about a six inch P-trap, make sure to fill it with water. Um, that's enough to keep the unit from leaking water out the sides. Um, as always, you have sitting water there, so make sure to clean those P-traps fairly, 
fairly frequently. Um, you can see on the picture on the right here, they actually have a little red cap um, that they plumb that they had when they, their plumber did their, their drain line there. So it's very easy to pop that off and clean out that P-trap. So generally recommend if you hard plumb it, give yourself an access port so you can keep that clean um, and you should be good to go. Um, and another uh, another note to mention is as long as you're keeping those those condensate lines clean, the, the water coming off of our coils is, is essentially distilled water. Uh, we use the E-coat on the coil so that you're not getting metals and stuff leaching off. So very easy to reclaim the water. Um, and especially when you pair it with something like a hydrologic system. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in, Aaron, and talk about that at all. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Josh. So, you know, one thing that uh, obviously with our the recent acquisition of Hydrologic uh, underneath the, the the Hawthorne brand, um, really excited to you know to to start to uh, promote you know the the arc system that Hydrologic offers and you know with uh, especially on the West Coast with water being such a valuable resource, um, you know, water conservation top of mind. It's getting you know the any of the the water we're pulling from the air, getting it treated and then getting it back into the supply line. Uh, rather than it going down the drain. So Hydrologic has the units available today. They hook up nicely to the uh, uh, to the Quest units. It's going to be plumbed in, and then you have you're able to recycle that water. Um, it's it's truly amazing, and it really kind of fits the you know what's happening today within the within the U.S. and around the globe. So awesome. Um, something else, uh, you know, with ducting, uh, the unit, the Quest units can be ducted. Um, you can see here, we, we do offer a duct kit for our unit. Um, the, the thing I always recommend is less is more. <laughs> Don't get too creative. Um, the photo on the right here is, is maybe a, a bit too creative. Uh, we do recommend keeping the duct under 20 feet if possible. Um, you know, try and do as few, few bends. Um, you know, there's, there are cases when you do have to duct further than 20 feet, or maybe you do have to add, add bends in just to get the air where you need it to go. Um, you know, uh, one thing you can do is add booster fans, but I'd really recommend having an engineer an engineer do that. There's really a lot of, uh, special calculations that gotta be made. Um, and, and the reason we recommend to keep the duct work a little less creative uh, is really, you know, anytime, anytime you introduce a bend or make the duct longer, you increase what's called static pressure. And that's basically, that makes, basically makes it harder for the fan to move air. So if we're getting less airflow, um, that correlates to less dehumidification. So if we're getting 10% less airflow, say through a unit, you might be seeing, you know, on, on a 506, like here, you might be seeing 50 pints um, less of dehumidification per day, which, which could really you know, really impact how able, how well you're able to control the room. So, um, you know, if, if you do want to duct your units, this is what, uh, this is some examples of some really excellent duct work. You can see that uh, it's, it's, you know, real minimal, very few bends. Um, you know, the 225, you have the option to kind of have two, two arms come off. Um, but this is really what uh, just, some top tier duct work looks like. Um, but you know, it can be a great way to keep those units out of the room um, and give yourself more space within, inside, inside the room. You know, again, if you've only got maybe a 10 foot ceiling or an 11 foot ceiling and, and you're running out of space in the room and you got an attic space, consider throwing the units uh, up in the attic space. Um, and then, you know, when you do have your, 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 your maintenance, whether, you know, you're, you're cleaning your P-traps or changing your filters and you don't have to have somebody go in the room. So that could be nice as well. Um, and uh, continue with um, some installation tips. Something else I see from time to time is uh, is control control wire getting run next to the power lines, and so you you can see uh, you know there there might be a tendency um, to kind of zip tie all those cables together to make the install look nice and clean. Well, I can, I can certainly appreciate a nice clean install. Um, make sure not to run them right next to each other. What can happen is if you have uh, if you have a high voltage cable ran next to your low voltage cable, which is your control wire, what can happen is um, you can you can induce voltage in your in your control wire, and that can sometimes mess with with the unit turning on and off. And I've seen that on a couple of sites where um, the D, you know the control was telling the DHU to turn on, but it, you know the control wire was running next to a power cable, so that control signal was getting interrupted. And, and they weren't actually seeing the D who ever turn on and they're having humidity issues because of it. So definitely make sure to keep those separate. 
um, and, 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 and resist the urge to <laughs> zip tie those together. Um, in continuing on, uh, another thing uh, I, I see is, is you know, not hooking the units up to proper voltage. So um, our 230 volt units do need to be between 220 and 240. So um, it's pretty easy to verify you know, what you have. Um, 208 is really common at a lot of commercial facilities, um, but it does have the potential to damage the unit. When you run a lower voltage, you end up running a higher current. And we do see that uh, have a tendency to burn out uh, relays, blowers, and, and sometimes compressors as well. Um, and so if you do look on the Quest unit, um, I've, got a, I've got a picture there of, of the tag. It does tell you to keep it between 220 to 240. I know I've had a, a couple customers where they were assured by their contractor that uh, you know, it would be fine because there is some 230 volt equipment out there that can be hooked up to 208. You know, you can just point them to the nameplate, um, and it does it does direct them to the amount, the proper amount of voltage being hooked up. So, what if you only have 208 and 277 available? Um, what I typically recommend, uh, if if you're kind of already you know down the line and in, in your project is is using buck boost transformers. Um, sometimes there's not enough space at a site to put in a 230 volt panel. But uh, the, like the buck booster you see here, that's a about the size of a shoe box, if not a little bit smaller. Pretty easy to install. You can just uh, basically take a, either a leg of 208 or 277 and, and drop it to uh, and, and make it the proper voltage for the unit to make sure that you're not burning out any fan motors or, or, or relays or things like that. Like I said, the, the units are work incredibly well. Um, when, when I do, when I, whenever I'm on site and someone says, oh, hey, I'm having an issue with a 506, I'd say 90% of the time it's it's because it's on 208 and, and we had a relay burnout or something like that. So just something to be aware of. Um, it's a real easy fix um, uh, with, with a buck boost transformer and uh, you can potentially save yourself some headache down the line. All right, so one other, uh, you know, the one thing that really goes hand in hand with your, with your cooling system, your dehumidification, is is proper airflow. So you know, even the best HVAC system in the world that's properly sized, spec, uh, perfectly installed. If we don't have enough airflow in that space um, to really make sure the air is mixing around, it almost doesn't matter. So you know, I, I'd say definitely don't cut corners on the airflow. Be very intentional about how you're moving the air around the room. And uh, what's good is you don't have to guess. Um, Hawthorne has a whole team of, of technical people that are, that are willing to help you with your fan layouts. Um, uh, as you can see here on, on the bottom right, there's an example of, of uh, kind of a proper layout for a, a, a grow facility. Um, and, and essentially what there's a couple of things you want to make sure your, your airflow system does. You want to make sure you're, you're, you're mixing the air in the room um, because we want to make sure that, you know, that, that we're, we're, we're avoiding, uh, avoiding hot pockets. Um, we want to make sure to, that we're moving the air that's underneath the benches and the canopy. Um, you know, CO2 tends to be a heavier gas. So if you're supplementing your, uh, your room with CO2 that will have a tendency to fall to the bottom of the room. So definitely want to make sure that we're getting air um, moving underneath those benches and, and kicking that air up and making sure it mixes. Um, we also need above air, uh, you know, above canopy air movement, making sure the plants are have a nice wiggle to them um, that we're getting, you know, a, about a, a foot per second or so across the canopy. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're using a multi-tier system, some sort of rack ventilation system is going to be key. Um, I've worked with quite a few people that have, have, have tried to, to get away with not using it. And it's really, it's really just one of those things you, you got to have some way to get the air because you air, air in that lower tier because um, you've got effectively a metal ceiling, right? Um, so really, really important to have some type of rack ventilation system to, to make sure that air is moving. Um, and one thing I say is oscillating wall fans, you know, they've been in the industry a really long time and a real common thing to use. Um, if, if your rooms are really getting over a couple hundred square feet, I've generally found that just having those mounted along your walls is enough. Typically, you need some inline fans in there to mix air around the room um, and, and some under canopy stuff as well. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you want to touch on some of the air, air, air movement stuff and, and Hawthorne's technical team's capabilities. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Josh. I, I think one big call out here is, you know, as you're working through and any of the, the you know, attendees as they're building out the design of their facility, you know, Hawthorne does, you know, in, in partnership with Quest, but also our internal teams, 
the ability that the top right there is actually uh, computational fluid dynamics, also known as CFD. Um, we've we've kind of branded it airflow mapping, but what that does is we can you know regenerate uh, the the 3D uh, structure of the room, and then we can plan for where the airflow is going to land as you know the plants mature as they go through. Obviously, you know it's all geometry, um, but you know planning ahead and, and making sure that the the fans are located in the right location and that we're just getting a, a good overall balance uh, within that space. Um, microclimates are really, you know, that's what we're trying to prevent with all this different equipment. Uh, but having this, you know, kind of this new visibility into, uh, you know, what's happening with the airflow, uh, where, where it is getting it, and especially before you ever have to um, get the, uh, before you ever have to install it, we can plan ahead and, and say, hey, mount this at seven feet uh, on the wall and have it angled this direction. So, um, and then as far as a charge for CFD analysis, we actually offer this as a complimentary service based on uh, the total package you buy from Hawthorne. So, um, you know, before uh, we'd offered it with, uh, you know, a lighting package or a HVAC package, but just, you know, as you're going through and you're designing it, talk to your retailer or talk to the Hawthorne uh, rep and they'll get you in there and stuff and talk about, you know, what, what qualifications uh, to get that, uh, that type of service. Awesome, yeah, super, super key. Like I said, you know, the best HVAC system in the world can't come overcome poor airflow and all these things do do work together um, to, to really ensure that you've got, got excellent climate control. Um, one other thing I do like to make a note of is, uh, is, is a note on controls. So, um, you know, controls can really be broken down into three broad categories. Um, you know, you've got kind of your most basic, uh, which is your thermostat, humidistat, um, you've got kind of your intermediate level controls, which is your, uh, which is kind of your off the shelf gardening controls. Um, you know, they're pretty much set up where you can take it and kind of DIY your control system. And then beyond that, you have your kind of customizable building management system, and that's really kind of your advanced. Um, and so, you know, for the for a long time in the industry, thermostat, humidistats were used, and you can, you know, you can get them to work quite well to control your space. Um, but there are some limitations, um, and so I always encourage people to try and implement uh, some of the elements below, which would be, you know, uh, zone control, uh, uh, getting, you know, kind of remote or internet access. Um, uh, a lot of the kind of the intermediate um, options allow you to stage your units as well. Um, and, and then also, you know, the, one of the biggest things is data logging. So really knowing what is being able to look back and know what's going on in your room without having to be in there and, and you know, even be able to log in from your, from your couch at home to see what your grow rooms are doing is pretty huge. Um, as with anything, there's always, uh, there's always, you always have to dial in your, your space. And so, you know, being able to make data-driven decisions is, is, is huge. And so, um, like I said, you can still make a thermostat humidistat combo work. You can still get those things to be staged. Um, but often, uh, you know, they don't data log or, or really have, have remote access. So there's some, some limitations there. So always encourage people to, to you know, again, uh, uh, everything works together. Um, uh, your system's only as good as the weakest link. So consider potentially going uh, uh, at least within kind of an intermediate level control, um, just to make sure you're getting the most out of your HVAC system. Um, and again, that you have, have data to really make decisions about your airflow and, and other things like that. Um, and then uh, kind of along that line, um, don't forget to calibrate your sensors. So, um, any, any temperature sensor or humidity sensor out there probably needs to be calibrated from time to time. Um, you know, I've, I've got a picture of our Quest, uh, our Quest humidistat on there, but really any, any humidistat out there, any control system, um, I'd highly recommend using a hygrometer just to calibrate it. Um, you know, if your sensor is a couple percent off, um, and that's your eyes into the room, your, your, your HVAC system can only control based on what it's seeing in the room. And so um, always, always important to make sure, uh, make sure your stuff's calibrated um, so that again, you're, you're, you're dialing in your humidity as, uh, and your temperature as tightly as possible. Um, and that's, that's pretty much all I have on as far as, you know, proper spec and installation. Um, as promised, uh, 
Uh, I've got a kind of a sneak peek of our unit coming out. Um, so come by our booth at uh, the, our numbers 3541. Um, and if you want to be kind of the first to hear, you can also head to our website uh, uh, forward slash something awesome is coming and sign up for email alerts and you'll get, uh, you'll be the first to hear about the new units coming out and you get, you'll be able to see the unit live uh, at MJVIS here in a month or so. So yeah, I guess now's a, a great time to open up for questions. I saw that a couple of things popped into the chat. So um, I guess we can, we can jump into that unless you have anything you want to add, Aaron. No, I think that, I mean, one thing on the, you know, the, the, the new product that we're unveiling at MJ Biz, uh, it does sound like we're going to give away uh, a, a couple of free units there too. So make sure you do stop by the booth, sign up, um, you know, and uh, uh, it's, you know, incredible product and just super excited to work with uh, the Quest team on getting this out there uh, for the growers. Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited. It's going to be going to be awesome. Excellent. Well, uh, Josh and Aaron, thanks so much for that presentation. You know, while we're on this subject, I'll definitely remind the audience to jot down the information on the screen there and certainly keep an eye out from Cannabis Business Times as, as we're working with uh, the Quest team to run a sweepstakes for one of those units as well. Uh, so certainly a lot of exciting things uh, coming up in the very near future. Um, you know, we did have a few questions coming in during the presentation. Uh, I'll remind the audience to check out the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and, and type your questions in there. I'm going to hit a few of those. I know, Aaron, you were addressing a few along the way, uh, but just for the benefit of the crowd here, I'll start with one. Um, do you recommend these units for greenhouses? And maybe I'll add a little bit to that. Um, is a lot of what we're talking about here applicable to the greenhouse environment as well in general, or are there different considerations that greenhouse operators might want to keep in mind? Sure. Um, yeah, you can definitely use these units in greenhouses. We have quite a few greenhouse customers. Um, generally, uh, uh, generally, the one of the one of the challenges uh, ventilation is is one of the main the main ways of controlling humidity in the greenhouse. But often, um, when you hit the night cycle, um, it may be too cold where you're getting too much of a humidity swing or something like that if you try to use ventilation at night. Because um, if you know, especially if you're in maybe a colder climate where it might be, you know below 20 degrees outside, you probably don't want to ventilate with 20 degree air because it just throws your whole your whole climate off. So no, absolutely. So generally the best, uh, one of the best strategies for controlling humidity during the night cycle in a greenhouse is going to be, you know, putting some standalone dehumidifiers in there. We typically calculate it about the same way we do an indoor grow. There's obviously some other variables. We look at um, you know, uh, generally greenhouses aren't as well sealed. So, you know, you do have to account for infiltration uh, from moisture from the outside leaking in and things like that. But um, no, these, you know, we, like I said, we do have a lot of greenhouse customers um, and generally uh, it tends to be uh, the most reliable strategy for controlling your, your humidity at nighttime when it's, you know, either super cold or potentially, you know, rainy or foggy outside and you don't want to bring that air inside your greenhouse. Yeah, sort of as a follow-up, uh, and speaking of, of the outdoors, um, anything to keep in mind as we head into winter months where the, I mean, in many parts of the U.S. and least and, and Europe and elsewhere, uh, obviously the temperature will drop significantly. Uh, any winter considerations that might be worth mentioning here? Uh, as far as the Quest units, um, you know, they should always be, they should always be installed indoor. They're not an outdoor unit. So generally, um, there's not any special considerations you have to take, uh, for the Quest units because they're, they're installed indoors. So, um, hopefully shielded from the elements. Um, but I mean, as far as your cooling system, um, make sure you, if, if you're in a cold climate, make sure you got a cold weather kit. Um, so your AC, for example, isn't freezing up. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if, if it's, you know, negative five outside or something like that. Um, and most, uh, most manufacturers have what's called the low ambient kit, um, or a cold weather package for their, for their air conditioner. So I'd say if, if, if maybe you started in the summer and you haven't hit a winter season yet, I'd maybe double check with your, your contractor and make sure you have something installed there. Otherwise what happens is a lot of, uh, a lot of air conditioners, for example, will, you know, if, if not change from the factory setting, will stop running at about 40 degree when it's 40 degrees outside. Um, because, you know, if it's a home or a business, you probably don't need cooling when it's, you know, 40 degrees outside, you probably just need heating. So, um, just, just double check that, uh, the rights that your equipment's been set up for, um, some winter operation, you should be good to go. 
Excellent. I know, um, you know, the phrase purpose built has been sort of a theme throughout this presentation. Um, we have a question here regarding the advantages of having the dehumidification equipment decoupled from the HVAC system. Could you sort of maybe, uh, I suppose, elaborate on that thread a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's there's a couple advantages um, uh, to, to doing decoupled. Um, I think one of, one of the biggest is that, you know, your dehues by and large do your dehumidification at night. Um, and your, your air conditioners do your cooling and your dehumidification during the day. Maybe during some heavy waterings, you have your dehues kick on, but for the most part, um, I'd say your cooling system carries the, the brunt of the, does the brunt of the work during the day, your dehues do the brunt of work at night. And so uh, what that really allows for is kind of a 12 hour break. So you get, you know, your cooling system gets to turn off, you get everything gets to cool down, you know, uh, uh, when, when you decouple it, when you don't decouple it, you end up, you know, you're running those systems 24 seven hours on end and even a well-built system. That's a, that's a tall order. So the nice thing about decoupling your system is you get, you really are giving your, your cooling system a, a 12 hour break for the most part, uh, uh, every day. And so I think you can really, uh, really extend the life of your equipment, um, doing that. Um, the other thing is that it, it, uh, it allows you some, uh, uh, allows you some, some more redundancy. So, you know, you're by, by having more systems serving that space, um, <clears throat> you're really, uh, you're really limiting, you're, you're, you're not, you don't have all your eggs in one basket. You know, if, if you have mechanical problems with your AC, that's okay. Your DHUs are still there to kind of kick in and handle the load. You might have to dim your lights a little bit, but you should be okay till you can get a tech out there to fix it. Um, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it just really limits your liability. Um, you know, when you, with, with the Quest units, and decoupled by by pairing a really efficient dehumidifier with a you know with a, a, a even just a standard cooling system, because of the efficiency of that dehumidifier, you're really able to put together a, a your your HVAC system as a whole uh, becomes becomes a lot more efficient. Um, some of the other things is if you if you do change anything down the line, um, you know uh, I, I I don't think I've had any project start on day one that by the time it was actually built didn't change something, um, and and even once it's built, a lot of times stuff will change. Um, I you know some guys will go from single to two tier, um, maybe add another bench, maybe add a couple plants, um, uh, you know Mac kind of maximizing the square footage of those rooms, and so um, if you do add you know, basically increase your load. You know, if you add more plants in there or something like that, you're increasing your water load. You need more dehumidification. It's real easy to just add a couple more dehues. Um, and, and, you know, hopefully you have enough cooling. Um, that might not be as easy to add, but what's really nice with the Quest units is they're very easy to install. Um, and, you know, they're generally stocked. So if you do find, oh man, I didn't put in enough um, or, or, you know, I, I added more plants, so I need you know, an extra couple hundred pints of dehumidification really easy to add uh, and, and kind of step into exactly what you need. Um, I think, and I think, yeah, it's, that's generally some of the, some of the, the, the top benefits for doing a decoupled. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, we've got a question here that relates back to the, the slide with the examples of excellent duct work. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as we, we may recall the photo on the left, this person in the audience is asking whether the unit can be laid on its side to eliminate a 90 degree bend. Uh, I don't know. I mean, and we can certainly generalize that, but I know that that photo came up earlier in the, in the presentation. Is that something that's uh, possible to eliminate some of that, uh, some of those issues? Definitely not. So you don't, you never, um, you don't want to turn the unit ever on its side if you can help it. If you're trying to get it into say a crawl space, you do have to turn it on its side, make sure to leave it overnight um, at least. Um, I think of it kind of like a refrigerator, right? If you ever are transporting a refrigerator and you have it upside down or on its side, you, you can't just turn it, you know, plug it in when you get home, you have to sit it upright, let it sit for a second before you, before you turn it on. So, um, you know, it's the, comp the units do have to be upright. Um, the refrigeration system will not work properly if the unit's on its side. Excellent. Um, I know there's obviously a lot of variables that we talked about, but in terms of uh, lighting, could you talk a bit about the effect of a grow operation that may be using LEDs and how that type of lighting system might affect uh, dehumidification needs in the room? Yeah, so um, LEDs, uh, if, if you think, 
um, of a general, say, thousand square foot space. Um, an LED per square foot is going to add a lot less heat to your grow room, about 40% um, to, to your per, per square foot to your, to your grow room versus maybe a, a high pressure sodium light. Um, and so, you know, since it's adding less heat, you generally, you're going to put in a smaller, smaller air conditioning system, uh, which in turn is going to do less dehumidification than, you know, the same cooling system you might've put in for your HPS lighting. So um, generally what I find is that um, when doing an LED facility, you might have your dehumidifiers helping out more during the daytime um, than they would in maybe an HPS grow. And, and that's not, and one of the, one of the common um, things I hear is that plants transpire more under LED. Um, they actually transpire about the same, um, maybe even a little bit less depending on, depending on the, the cultivation style. Um, but what really what's happening is that your air conditioner, which is which does the bulk of the work when during the lights on just got smaller because the lights aren't as hot. So it doesn't need to be as big. Um, and so because it's a little bit smaller, it will, you know, it'll do a little bit less dehumidification. And then you have to, uh, then, then you might have your, your standalone dehumidifiers, which are, you know, there for your nighttime cycle. Those might end up kicking on more often during the daytime to help, to help out. Um, most of the time you don't need to add more um, than you would normally, um, meaning that it's probably, you know, if, if, if you have a thousand square foot room, you probably have the same amount of dehumidifiers in there, regardless of whether it's HPS or LED. Um, sometimes you have to add a little bit more. It really depends on the case, um, especially since normally in LED, you're running a little bit warmer and wetter as well. So you're, you're getting a little bit more capacity out of your dehues. Um, so like I said, there's some niche cases where you might have to add some more dehumidifiers, um, but most of the time, you know, water in, water out, you'll be good to go. What you might see is that they just run a little bit more during the daytime than you used to. Certainly. Uh, we have a few questions here. I know we you know, sort of touched on uh, external cold temperatures. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, realizing that we're talking about indoor units here, uh, but we do have questions relating to uh, the climate in Jamaica, the climate in Africa. Uh, there wasn't a country specified there, but anything worth touching on regarding external either high or overly humid uh, climate conditions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you've got, uh, uh, if you've got, say, a, a really hot climate, for example, um, you know, you're, you're probably going to have to oversize your air conditioning system a little bit. So, um, you know, even, you know, I'm, I'm based out of Los Angeles, 75 degrees all the time, it's wonderful. Um, but if I go four hours inland to Las Vegas, where it's a bit hotter, a desert climate, um, you know, the cultivations there have to put in more air conditioning because, um, and the reason is that a, a 20 ton air conditioning, for example, is rated at 95 degrees um, outside. Um, so, but when you start, you know, when that outdoor temperature starts getting up to 110, 115 degrees Fahrenheit or 120 sometimes, um, what you find is that that 20 ton does a little bit less cooling. It gets a little bit less efficient and you might lose 10, 15% um, capacity on that unit. So if you're building out in a, in a hot, arid climate, um, uh, I would, you know, I'd run the math make sure your engineer is 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 accounting for those hot temperatures and understand that general rules of thumb like a half ton of light might not apply to you you might have to oversize um beyond beyond general rules of thumb so um i just be i'd expect to have to put in a bigger air conditioning system than what you might typically see on instagram or in the in, you know maybe some industry averages just because you're in a hotter climate you're not going to get as much cooling capacity come you know, those summer months. Um, if you're in a real humid climate, um, you know, I'd, you know, do your best to make sure your building seals up well. Um, you may have to add in a, a little bit extra dehumidification to account for, you know, what we call infiltration, um, because that outside moisture will have a tendency to, to, to leak into those, to, to the spaces that are drier. Um, uh, and, you know, every time somebody opens a door and to go in out of the room, you know, that's a, that's a chance for moisture to leak in as well. And so, you know, in, in, in my projects that are my cultivators that grow in, in more humid climates, a lot of them find they might have to add, you know, a little bit more uh, dehumidification than, than the dry climates just to account for, you know, some of that moisture leaking in. 
it's not anything crazy. They don't have to put in double the capacity or anything like that. Um, you know, on a like a thousand square foot room, for example, you might have to put in an extra, I'm just ballparking this, but say 50 pints of dehumidification, assuming you've got good SOPs and people aren't leaving the doors open and things like that. Sure. Um, got a question here, I think maybe um, relating to that recent lighting question. Um, but this, this audience member is asking if there's sort of a ballpark percentage difference in um, transpiration rates from day mode to night mode and, and how that might be accounted for on the dehumidification side, meaning is there a significant difference from day to night uh, that the plants are transpiring? Um, that's a great question. Um, transpiration rates do vary quite a bit. Um, so as soon as the plant wakes up, it's going to start, you know, the, that transpiration rate is going to pick up. Um, and it, in, you know, it, it really, it's really more, there's, there's a whole lot of factors that, that, that will, you know, that will affect that transpiration rate. You know, the VPD, what, what are they keeping their rooms at as far as temperature and humidity? Um, uh, you know, how much, what's the wattage per square foot they're running? So it's, I, I don't know that there's a general rule of thumb answer for what the transpiration rate, uh, rate might be. Um, generally the, the nighttime transpiration rate at a minimum um, after, you know, uh, as soon as the lights go off and the plants start to go to sleep and we see that rate fall, Generally, it's somewhere between 20 and 40 percent based on a bunch of different factors. But I mean, it, it's going to vary between strains, you know, depending on your irrigation strategies, whether you water once or multiple times throughout the day. I mean, there's there's probably 10, 15 different factors that are going to that are going to, you know, go into this on, on what that is. And it's it's one of those things that I don't think there's a good rule of rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did have a question here relating to water load measurement and aeroponics. Uh, and I know uh, it was sort of addressed um, by Aaron in the, the Q&A box here, but just wanted to touch on that real quick while we're here. Um, any sort of best practices for water load measurement uh, in general, and also uh, with the aeroponic producers, anything, I mean, I, you know, this may be a bit more complicated than a, a short answer, but uh, anything worth bearing in mind uh, on, on that side of things? Um, as far as how to calculate the water load in the facility? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, really what we what we try to boil down to with 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 water in, water out is is understanding what the plants are drinking. So there's, you know, if if you don't know necessarily what what you're what you're feeding each one, there's a couple other metrics, maybe how often you're, you're refilling your feed tanks and things like that. Um, uh, there's a couple different ways we can approach the problem um, to kind of back sort of back into what are the plants drinking. Um, and I'd say, yeah, I don't know that there's a, I guess it's going to be real case dependent. So, you know, if, if you have any specific questions about your, your, your application, reach out, you know, after this webinar, we can talk through it for sure. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I'll definitely uh, remind the audience here to, to jot down that contact info and, um, you know, we'll be making sure everyone gets connected after this event. I'll remind everyone also that we have been recording today's webinar and we'll be distributing uh, the link via email to all registrants very soon here. Um, so thank us, thanks everyone for attending and, and certainly to Josh and Aaron and the whole Quest and Hawthorne teams. I want to thank you all for providing the information today. This is fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having us. It was great. Uh, great sharing, sharing with everybody. Yeah. Thanks so much, Eric. We really appreciate it. And then, you know, any, any other questions, I mean, just make sure that everyone has, uh, you know, the ability to, to reach out to Josh or I happy to help out. Excellent. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everybody.